Hi, I'm a possum and I find garbage. And this is the 10th official possum review. I'm a big boy YouTuber now. And like every big YouTuber, I need an obnoxious dubstep intro. So I had one of my fans make one for me. Hit it. Well, that was terrible. I'm never using that again. Speaking of terrible things, no effort put into them. Today's garbage is Suburban Sasquatch, a shot and video horror movie from 2004. You might know about this movie from what it is about uh, uh, the best of the worst spotlight video about it. That's how I, that's how I learned about it. And then I realized the name sounded familiar, so I looked at my DVDs and found one of those 50 movie packs, and sure enough, it turns out I already had a copy of this now legendary movie in my possession for years and never even realized it. Have you ever looked through the pockets of an old pair of pants and found a dollar? It kind of felt like that, except the dollar was a greasy old hot dog that you put in your pocket like a normal person this is like six months ago and forgot about it. So you, you probably don't need me to tell you that, uh, that this movie is bad, like almost everything else I review. But here's the thing, not all bad movies are created equal. Some movies have a multitude of minor flaws which compound on the movie until it breaks. Some movies have one or two really big flaws that by themselves are enough to sink the whole movie. Some movies have flawed premises which cause them to fail before they even start. Most bad movies are just boring and don't inspire enough disgust to even be worth talking about. But some movies suffer from the unholy trinity. Bad premise, bad execution, and multiple gaping flaws. Suburban Sasquatch is one of those movies. It is a masterpiece of schlock. And speaking as a connoisseur of garbage, it's truly delicious. All of the bad elements of Suburban Sasquatch mesh together to create such a perfect storm of unintentional hilarity that if it was intentional, it would be a brilliant satire of amateur filmmaking in the early days of digital video. I mean, this was made back in 2004, so it wasn't like today when anybody could go out and buy a fancy DSLR or mirrorless camera and shoot high-quality video with a shallow depth of field to give it that cinematic look. They would have been using mini-DV tapes on a 3CCD camera with maybe five stops of dynamic range. Hmm, what's that noise? Oh snap, it's Sasquatch! Only a small handful of people have ever laid eyes on him. Just like my last review about the Netflix original series, The Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance, which not a lot of people watch even though they should, preferably with their ad block turned off. I better go get my camera. Alright, smile, you hairy bass- Hey, hey, where'd he go? Aw, oh, man. Yeah, he'll be back. They always come back. Review time! The movie starts with a credit sequence in a reportedly rented CGI forest, accompanied by the most sinister pan flute music you've ever heard. We're off to a great start. Then we fade into the movie. Pause it. This is the first shot of the movie, and it's quite possibly the worst day for night shot I have ever seen. Here's a tip for filmmakers. If you're going to do day for night, don't show the sky. The bright white sky isn't going to look dark when you turn down the brightness in post. If you're going to show headlights, use a keyframed mask or something so they don't get darkened with the rest of the picture. Alright, unpause. Really pause it again. It's even worse in the next shot. See, when your video is so overexposed that everything is blown out, that detail is lost and it can't be brought back, no matter how much you darken the image in post. This completely defeats the purpose of shooting day for night. At this point, you would be better off actually shooting it at night. Okay, continue. Yeah, we gotta go Pause it! And then we get these shots where the car is moving like three miles per hour because the cameraman had to walk alongside the car. Like they couldn't think of a way to rig the camera to the car. Jesus Christ, we're like three shots into the movie. So these two characters drive around for a while, hoping we won't notice that it's the same stretch of road and they're just going back and forth. Then Sasquatch runs in front of the car, apparently so fast that neither of these two can see what it was, so they keep driving. But then we see Sasquatch in all his low-budget glory. Holy sh**. So in a confusing edit, Sasquatch manages to get the guy out of the car and rips his rubber arms off, then smashes his CGI head. 
And then, in another confusing edit, the girl runs away, but is then suddenly back by where the car where Sasquatch can reach her. And then he rips her apart too. Then we get some nice aerial footage. Oh my god. Then we cut to a Hispanic lady playing a Native American. Taco Hannes goes to talk to her Italian grandpa, who I'm gonna call Chief Servino. And as they camp out in the director's backyard, he hands her a bow and tells her she has to go kill Sasquatch as part of her stereotype, I mean, spirit quest. We then cut to our protagonist, Rick, being woken up by a phone call. A police officer tells him they found two bodies by the road, so he grabs his notepad and runs out the door. The police continue to look around the scene of the mauling, which is roped off with caution tape, I guess because they ran out of police tape, where the guy who got his head smashed in ex inexplicably has it intact again, and two cops, Officer Eyebrows and Officer Goatee, stand around in their dress shirts with brown tape on them, which are supposed to be police uniforms, holding their guns in their hands because they don't have holsters. Officer Goatee sees a big footprint in the dirt and gets triggered. Then Rick shows up and Officer Eyebrows tells him this isn't a typical homicide, but then Officer Goatee tells him not to tell anyone. So it turns out Rick is some kind of amateur journalist, and he sees this as his big chance to make a name for himself, but Officer Goatee wants to keep it under wraps. Cut to two rednecks fishing in the disgusting Brown River. What are they even expecting to catch there, typhoid? But then Sasquatch comes stomping up. <laughs> Dave! So Sasquatch rips one of the rednecks apart while the other one just stands there like an idiot until this happens. Then we cut to Rick driving up to the high school that the movie expects us to believe is a newspaper company, even though you can see kids practicing some kind of sport outside through the windows. Rick tries to tell his boss about the murders and that the police are covering it up, but for some reason this guy who runs a newspaper company doesn't seem to think that double homicide and police corruption are newsworthy, and he tells Rick to go f*** himself. <laughs> Look kid, businesses work on money, not promises. I make my money from sales, alright? You write me a story that's gonna sell. Now, this scene is all over the place. It keeps cutting to different angles at random times, which is probably because the actors kept messing up their lines, and they had to cut multiple takes together to get full sentences out of them. Also, the audio keeps changing. When Rick talks, there's this weird wobbling effect, like they had to aggressively filter out background noise. But I promise, this will be one story you won't forget. I also like how the wide shot is totally off-level. Anyway, Rick leaves, then we cut to some kid kicking a ball around in little circles like there's something mentally wrong with him. But then Sasquatch comes walking up. We get Sasquatch's POV shot where we can clearly see the kid should see Sasquatch approach it because he's right in front of him. But then the kid sees him at the last second, so he grabs his ball and runs into the house. The kid tries to tell his mother, but she doesn't believe him. He was big and hairy and he had huge fangs! Well, you know, monsters don't really exist. Why don't you go outside and play? Monsters are not real, like the boogeyman or your father. They're not really there. So because this kid's mother is too stupid to realize her kid might be describing a stray dog or a pervert who might be hanging out in their yard, she sends him back outside so she doesn't have to deal with him. So the kid continues to play even though he knows Sasquatch is lurking around, and he somehow doesn't hear the thousand pound ape stomping around and breathing louder than Movie Bob on a flight of stairs. But then the stupid mother sees Sasquatch out the window and runs out to save her stupid kid. When the mother's attempt to fight off the giant ape with a broom predictably fails, she gets dragged off. We then cut to Officer Eyebrows and his cruiser talking to Officer Goatee on the radio with the kid in the back seat. Don't worry, son. You'll be alright. Who's coming to get you? Bigfoot. Then we cut to another overexposed day for night shot where we see Taco Hannes talk to the CGI eagle, which I guess is supposed to be her spirit animal or something. What? I I'm sorry, your bad acting and terrible sound mixing make it hard to understand you. Don't you have any patience? I have to concentrate. What? Whatever. We then cut to one of the rednecks from earlier who is somehow still alive even though he's been laying face down in the water since yesterday. He wakes up and we get to watch him officially wander around the woods until he stumbles upon a cave. 
We then cut to him walking alongside a large rock in a shot that's supposed to look like he's entering the cave. And even though he sees fresh human remains, he decides to go deeper. I remind you, the, the last thing this guy remembers is watching his friend get dismembered by a Sasquatch, and now he's d***ing around in caves full of body parts. So he goes deeper into the cave, past the CGI rocks, and finds a chamber with garbage bags taped to the walls because they just filmed it in the director's living room and couldn't think of a better way to make a black background. Oh, and I guess the mother from before is in there. But before he can do anything, the redneck hears Sasquatch's horrifying roar and runs away. I just want to talk about the sound effect for a minute. This has to be the funniest sound effect in any movie ever, and it gets reused over and over. They could have gone on the internet and downloaded a lion roar or a bear growl or something and put some modulation on it to make it sound like a monster. But instead, the director just recorded two seconds of himself doing this grumbling, cartoonish Frankenstein noise. Roar, roar, roar. Roar, roar, roar. <laughs> I love it. It's like that's like an actual Sasquatch would sound like. Hey, hey, what are you doing? That's my door. Me, I'm Sasquatch. Me here, maiden call. Come for squish squish. Excuse me, what? You make maiden call. You want make squish squish. Me make squish squish with you. Uh, uh th that wasn't me. Then who make maiden call? Well, uh, it was, uh, Alex Contreras, Charles J. Harris, Echidna, John Guevara, Jaron Marles, John Wellington, Keith Paul, Lex Reardon, McSquizzy, Michael Lowe, o Ola Zancy, pa Paco, Ricky Barugo, The Sauce God, Toastface, Valentine Giovanni, Maximilian, George Fairfax, Vil Vilger Arson II, and Victor Alexandrovich Gontar. Me understand. Me go find ten dollar patrons and make squish squish with them. Yeah, uh, you go get them. Holy shit. So Officer Goatee walks around the park until he finds a public restroom where the redneck is hiding out. The redneck tells him about Sasquatch with his Oscar-worthy performance. You won't believe me. They didn't believe me. Like, I swear he was gonna eat me. He tells Officer Goatee that he was near some suburban development when he was attacked, and that brings us to the central theme of this movie. Much like the comparable film Birdemic, suburban Sasquatch is really about nature striking back at man for encroaching on nature. But also like Birdemic, this theme gets lost in the jumble of poor production value, baffling directorial decisions, and symbolism that makes no sense. Like the scene where we intercut between a woman eating a hot dog and Sasquatch eating a person. Like that's supposed to mean something. I don't know what it is about people who have no idea how to make movies trying to make movies with environmentalist themes. Anyway, Takahannis runs around with a bow and does nothing. Then we cut to two women walking around the woods. What was that? Wait, just a deer. Yeah, it was a man-shaped deer that walks upright and magically fades away. So Sasquatch comes stomping up to them, and even though they have every other direction to run in, they just stand there like the cornered or something until Sasquatch scratches one of them. And then he disappears or something because he, he, he just kind of stops attacking them in the next cut, giving them time to run away. But then he just catches up to one of them and rips her leg off. So even though Sasquatch apparently has teleportation powers, he decides to chase the other woman on foot until he catches her at a car and rips her apart in a really poorly edited sequence. And even though we can clearly see an arm being thrown through the air, the woman suddenly has both arms attached as Sasquatch starts to eat her, only for him to rip it off again. And I guess he just sat there for several hours, eating her body, bones and all, in broad daylight, without leaving any scraps at all, except for a tiny little squirt of blood. I don't know why they had him still eating the same arm he started with after he had apparently eaten the rest of her. They had other props. I guess they just forgot to bring him that day. Anyway, Takohana shows up and shoots Sasquatch with a CGI arrow, causing CGI blood to squirt out of him. 
so he runs away, and Takohanas doesn't bother to chase him. Maybe she remembered she had to go back to the fake Indian reservation to attend an Elizabeth Warren rally. We cut to Rick walking into an empty restaurant because they couldn't afford extras, and he talks to Ralphie from a Christmas story, who doesn't seem to know how to close his mouth. Rick moans to Ralphie about how his editor won't take his story, and Ralphie calls him a loser who should just give up on being a journalist. Look, it's a pipe. You'll have no future. What will you do when you're 70? Still run around investigating small but somewhat interesting stories? As Ralphie leaves, we get a nice artistic shot of Rick sitting there alone as the camera zooms out, making him look smaller on the screen to illustrate his feelings of inadequacy. Ooh, somebody read a filmmaking book. Now, to be fair, as poorly shot and acted as the scene is, its inclusion does give us some insight into our protagonist and his internal struggle. We know what Rick wants, and we know that he has to fight uphill battle to achieve his goal. This is character development, which is something many of the movies I review on this channel never even bother with. And that's what sets this movie apart from other bad movies which, while they may be more technically competent, are far more boring and forgettable. While the premise of Suburban Sasquatch is stupid and the movie is poorly executed, the writing is just minimally competent enough to be engaging at the most basic level, so we, the audience, have something to latch onto. That's what makes this a so bad it's good movie. Tons of movies have bad production value, but also have writing and pacing so bad that they are just painful to sit through. Suburban Sasquatch is not terminally boring like Little Red Riding Hood, or frustratingly idiotic like Alien 3000, or obnoxious and tedious like that other movie whose title I can't say because YouTube's demonetization bots don't like the T-word. Not all bad movies are bad in an entertaining way, but Suburban Sasquatch is, thanks to the filmmaker's earnest, albeit incompetent attempt to tell a real story. It just goes to show what a difference writing can make, even in Z-grade shot-on-video trash. So if you're an aspiring filmmaker, strive to get the writing right above all else. That way, if your movie turns out bad, at least it might be remembered as a funny bad movie instead of being forgotten about altogether. Rick leaves the restaurant and gets a phone call from Officer Eyebrows, who tells him about the two women Sasquatch mauled. Officer Goatee gives Officer Eyebrows for calling Rick. Oh, God. Officer Eyebrows wants to get outside help, but Officer Goatee tells him to leave it alone, but doesn't give a good reason why. There are some things here that are just bigger than you understand. Then, even though it's only been about 30 seconds since Officer Eyebrows called him, Rick shows up and Officer Eyebrows gives him a gun. Rick then goes over to the girl's remains and tries to take a picture, but Officer Goatee stops him. Then Rick finds a piece of one of the arrows Tokahana's shot at Sasquatch. Later that <clears throat> night. Officer Eyebrows parks his car by the side of the overexposed road and points his spotlight, which clearly isn't turned on. He calls Officer Goatee and asks him why he sent him out there. But then, Sasquatch emerges from the fog. Then he emerges again out of thin air, rendering that previous shot redundant. But I guess they were really proud of it and just had to put it in. John. It looks like a bear, John. No, it doesn't. Officer Goatee looks more like a bear than Sasquatch does. So Officer Goatee seems to know what's up, but then Sasquatch attacks. Oh wait, dear God is coming right at me! Ah! So after Sasquatch picks up and throws the low-resolution PNG of a police car, only for it to suddenly be right back where it was, Sasquatch casually walks away and disappears. Then Officer Eyebrows tells Officer Goatee he left, so Officer Goatee pulls out a photo of some white trash woman from his drawer. Don't let it happen. Oh, the plot's getting thicker. Thick like a nice frosty glass of Ovaltine. Meanwhile, Rick pours himself some fake liquor so he can drink it in his bedroom. Then he inspects the arrow he founds with a jewel in the arrowhead. Then we cut to some wine on, talking to some redneck about how she just moved into this subdivision. But then they hear something outside. The wine aunt goes outside to investigate, and she sees Sasquatch throwing around CGI boulders which cast shadows on the ground in a way that plainly doesn't match up with the live-action footage. And instead of running back into the house like a character in a movie directed by an actual human would have her do, the wine aunt runs outside. But then Takohana shows up to shoot more arrows. Get a load of this shot, where they digitally stretched out the top half of Sasquatch's body to make him look taller. They actually do this a few times in the movie, but not all the time, so it's like he changes size. So anyway, Takohana shoots Sh Sasquatch with an invisible arrow causing him to stumble back while fluctuating in brightness because they left the camera on auto-exposure. Then he tries to grab Taco Hannes, 
but she shoots him with another CGI arrow. So then he runs away and disappears in an awkward dissolve effect, which didn't quite work out because the camera moved between shots. Cut to Rick going to his grandma's house. Rick tells grandma about the story he's working on and shows her the arrowhead he found. Then she tells him to go where he found the arrowhead because God will give him an insight. We then cut to some guy who wanders around looking for his dog. Bossy! He finds his dog just as it gets found by Sasquatch, and then we get the funniest dog death scene ever committed to consumer-grade early 2000s digital video. Mossy, no! Sasquatch then proceeds to beat up the dog guy and steps on his ribs, killing him. Well, dog got it. What a crushing defeat. What the- what, hey, hey, what you- ah! Ugh. What the f*** is your problem? You lie to Sasquatch. Sasquatch wants Squish Squish. You give Squish Squish now! Why try asking politely, you prick? Come to Sasquatch. Oh, sh Back off! I got a broom, and I know how to use it. Ooh. Mmm. Sasquatch no need Squish Squish now. This much easier. Wait, what? Rick goes back to where he found the arrow and talks to himself, but we can barely hear him. Why am I doing this? I'm the only one who thinks this is a story. Should I just give up? Meanwhile, Taco Honest has a vision of Sasquatch while sitting in her nylon tent, which I think is supposed to be a teepee. Then she gets up and runs. Cut to some Karen eating a hot dog with no condiments on it while driving around in their SUV is full of shopping bags. The movie does this sort of intercutting with Sasquatch eating a person and in this garbage bag cave as if to juxtapose the two. The Karen and her friend drive around the subdivision for a while, but then the friend thinks she sees something, and even though she doesn't know what it is, it could just it could easily be a kid, she says they should call the police. Someone call the cops or the SPCA or something. something. So the friend calls the police and Officer Eyebrows answers some machine that I guess is supposed to be a radio, but they couldn't get one so they just used something else. I'm not sure what it is. It looks like a CD changer or something. In any case, Officer Eyebrows abandons the two horrified women to go talk to Officer Goatee. He says they should call animal control, but Officer Goatee stops him and says he will handle it. While that's going on, Rick gets a phone call from Officer Eyebrows who tells him to get to the subdivision. Then Sasquatch magically appears on top of the SUV with the two women and plunges through the sunroof, prompting them to abandon the vehicle. Hey, if Sasquatch can teleport, why doesn't he just appear inside the SUV? So anyway, the Karen gets killed by Sasquatch, and then he runs off after the other woman. But then Taco Hana shows up and uses her mystical Indian healing powers to bring the Karen back to life. What's up with this shot? So Sasquatch attacks Taco Hannes again. He picks up a CGI log because making a prop log out of styrofoam was just too hard. And I guess since Taco Hannes threw a couple of tomahawks into it, he can't throw it at her. Then Rick and Officer Goatee just show up just in time to watch Sasquatch run off with the woman. Taco Hannes chases him and Rick follows her. Stop Rick, come back! You don't know what you're doing! Damn it! Rick catches up to Takahana so she tells him to be quiet, but then Sasquatch disappears again. She explains that she's hunting Sasquatch, but Rick doesn't believe her, even though he literally just watched Sasquatch run away with a woman kicking and screaming on his shoulder. So as Takahana walks away, Rick picks up the arrowhead she just shot and asks her if she wants it. Th then she suddenly right next to him again and explains the magic is gone and it needs to be returned to the Earth. That's a good way to justify littering. So it turns out Sasquatch can only be killed by magical weapons. Rick asks Takohannes if he can follow her around so he can get the story. And even though Takohannes doesn't stand to benefit from his presence in any way, and he's more likely to be a, a hindrance to her than anything, she agrees to let him. Back at the police station, Officer Eyebrows asks Officer Goatee why he's trying to cover up the murders, and he starts t t telling his tragic backstory. We flash back to when Officer Goatee in his barbed wire tattoo sat on a swing with his wife. He gets up to go to get her some lemonade, and while he's gone, the wife just kind of sits there and watches Sasquatch slowly make his way up to her. Officer Goatee comes back in time and is, is start effeminately batting at the Sasquatch's chest like an angry teenage girl, 
but this tactic proves ineffective. So he runs to grab his duck hunting shotgun, and just and then proceeds to inexplicably run up to within arm's reach of Sasquatch, who e easily disarms him and steps on his leg. My leg! Sasquatch then carries off Officer Goatee's wife, and he, is, he watches helplessly. Damn it! So that's Officer Goatee's motivation, I guess. For some reason, Officer Eyebrows isn't outraged that Officer Goatee let his quest for revenge enable Sasquatch to continue running around killing people. Cut to Takahannis leading Rick back to her tent, where she explains that her tribe has been keeping Sasquatch's evil at, at bay for many generations, and that the Thunderbird told her how to find him. Yeah, I guess that's the Thunderbird. But these creatures aren't real. Not in this day and age. As opposed to some other age? We then cut to a couple rednecks trying to repair a pickup truck, when Sasquatch ominously emerges from the fog again and attacks. <sighs> Somehow, the redneck under the truck doesn't hear the other redneck getting ripped up, so he stays under the truck, giving Sasquatch the opportunity to grab his leg. <laughs> After Sasquatch beats the redneck to death with his own foot, we cut back to Rick and Takohanas. Takohanas apparently senses Sasquatch, so they run off to, to find him. She tells Rick that Sasquatch has magic powers because some things found in nature can make you hallucinate. Mushrooms, excretions from frogs, certain fish, they all have the ability to alter reality. He can move between planes of existence, appear as quickly as he disappears. So the filmmakers were licking toads and getting high on pufferfish toxin. That explains a lot. Then Rick says he doesn't believe in anything, and Takohanas calls him an a But then she senses Sasquatch again, and they give pursuit. Takohana shoots Sasquatch again, so he runs out into the road, and more confusing edits happen. Back at the police station, Officer Eyebrows talks to Officer Goatee about how they go to deal with Sasquatch. Then Officer Eyebrows calls up somebody named Zeke, saying he has a job for them. Sometime later, we see a piece of meat strung up as bait for Sasquatch. Rick and Takohanas have set up a trap. They talk about nothing until Sasquatch shows up. Takohanas shoots an arrow and misses, and Sasquatch chases them. I don't understand. He's gotten much stronger since you last met. More cunning. You blatantly missed him when he wasn't even looking at you. You can't blame that on him getting stronger. Rick and Takohanas hide next to a bush. Then Rick starts to spaz out because Sasquatch is attacking his mind. He's attacking your mind. Sasquatch walks right past them, I guess because his rubber mask limits his peripheral vision. And then he chases them again, so Takohana summons birds to attack him. This is you know, just because you can do CGI, that doesn't mean you should. So Sasquatch fades away, and for some reason, Takohanas blames Rick for his escape. I guess because everything is the white man's fault. Fine, I'm sorry. It's just that you're my best shot at a Pulitzer. Pulitzer? If you're gonna have a journalist character, can you at least make sure he knows how to pronounce Pulitzer correctly? We then cut to a POV shot of somebody looking through a rifle scope that's stretched vertically because whoever made this didn't understand the concept of pixel aspect ratio, and he tries to shoot Sasquatch with a stock sound effect. So after the bullet ricochets off a leaf, a group of rednecks with guns come walking up. They congratulate the one guy holding a handgun for his good shot, even though he missed, and despite the fact that the POV shot gave the impression that the shooter was using a scoped rifle. Anyway, one of the rednecks calls Officer Eyebrow, saying they found Sasquatch. And for some reason, they all seem to think they're hunting a bear. I'm assuming these are the guys Officer Eyebrows called earlier. Did he not tell them they would be hunting Sasquatch? because that seems like the kind of detail that might be important for determining your hunting strategy. Anyway, the rednecks shoot a comically exaggerated hail of bullets at Sasquatch, but they have no effect. Sasquatch claws a dude's throat open, and the movie holds on him dying for a good 20 seconds, like the editor forgot that there was a ferocious Sasquatch nearby with people shooting at it. One of the rednecks manages to throw a tiny net over Sasquatch's head, and somebody shoots him, causing him to fall over. 
and as he lays on the ground, the tiny net inexplicably turns into a big cartoon net that wobbles. Why? But then Sasquatch gets back up, stands on an off-camera box, and then off the rednecks charge at him in an overexposed shot so he can dispatch them one by one. <laughs> So Sasquatch kills off the rednecks, but the last one manages to tell the two officers on the phone something they already knew before he dies. It's Big Bird! We cut to Rick complaining to Takohanas how they're not making any progress killing Sasquatch and that he should just go home so he can make money. Takohanas tells him he should just he should give up his responsibilities because society doesn't have the right to tell him what to do, as if money isn't something you'd need if you don't want to spend your life living in a tent in the woods. Takohanas remarks how strange it is that Sasquatch is killing more people than usual, and that he's never been known to take hostages. She then sprinkles something on the ground as a ritual to find Sasquatch, and asks Rick if he's ever had a spiritual ex his experience. Can't say I have. I've never gotten my book deal never made a major story sale, so I guess God's been ignoring me for a while. So this back and forth between Rick and Takohanas goes on for a while, like the movie is trying to have some deep theme about the perils of the modern world, and our society's disconnect from the spirituality of nature or some shit like that. It's all very pretentious, and it's impossible to take seriously in a movie called Suburban Sasquatch. Then this pasty, flabby dork starts touching Takohanas, even though there hasn't been even a hint of romance between them up until now, they lean in to kiss each other. But then the Thunderbird makes noises at them, which Takohanas takes as a sign, so they go after the Sasquatch again. They find him stomping around in somebody's backyard, but then he uh, ambushes them and captures Takohanas, just appearing before Rick can shoot him with the gun the movie forgot he had until now. Later that night, the two cops look around inside a house for some reason. I really don't know why. I don't think it was ever established that they had to, why they had to come here. It's like they forgot to shoot a scene or something. Anyway, they go into the basement and find a bunch of dead bodies. One of the bodies starts flailing, and Officer's eyebrow starts puking, even though this scene isn't any more gruesome than any of the other mauling scenes he already saw. Then, instead of helping the guy who's flailing on the ground, or calling an ambulance or something, the two officers just kind of stand there. Then we cut to the garbage bag cave, where Sasquatch has Takohanas and the woman from earlier tied up. What's happened to you? It's awful. He... he... Oh my god, I'm so sorry. So Sasquatch shows up and grabs the woman, then we cut back to Rick being useless. Rick goes back to his boss who yells at him for not bringing him a story, and Rick finds a feather in his pocket. I guess this reminds him of something, because he then decides he's gonna go rescue Takohanas. Rick goes back to the tent and asks the Thunderbird for guidance. He follows it to the cave where he finds Takohanas and unties her. Takohanas grabs her bow and they run out of the cave. Sasquatch chases them, but Takohanas jumps over him and shoots him with another arrow, so he runs off again. Starting to get a little repetitive, isn't it? But it turns out Rick is injured. We cut to some old lady sitting around while a guy who looks like a serial killer dances in the middle of the living room with some of the worst rock music you've ever heard. The old lady hears Sasquatch breathing outside, so the music turns itself off even though nobody pushed any buttons, and she tells the serial killer to go see what the sound is. The serial killer looks out the door but doesn't see anything, but the old lady decides to call the police anyway. Officer Goatee answers the phone himself, I guess because they don't have operators in this town, and gets Officer Eyebrows and they leave. Does this town only have two cops or something? And why is Officer Eyebrows' office in a supply closet? Sasquatch tries to attack the old lady through the window, somehow failing to rip her head off. Then the serial killer walks up to the door, where Sasquatch is clearly visible out the window, and then he opens it. Then they run out the back door, then the two cops show up and they shoot at Sasquatch. Why does his gun sound like a camera? Officer Goatee grapples with Sasquatch and shoots a gas tank, causing it to explode. Then Sasquatch disappears again. Hey, I thought only magical weapons could hurt him. We did all we could do. And that's the last we see of Officer Goatee and Officer Eyebrows. 
Really, they just kind of give up and disappear for the rest of the movie. So we never get any closure for Officer Goatee's character arc. You'd think he would show up at the end to help Takohanas kill Sasquatch or something, and maybe die in battle so he can be with his wife, but no, the movie just gives up on him. Back at the tent, Takohanas does witch doctor stuff to heal Rick, explaining that a real doctor can't help him because Sasquatch's attacks are magical or something. I'm not sure how this 100-pound woman managed to drag this overweight slob back to the tent, but the movie didn't show it, so I guess we're not supposed to think about it. The next morning, Rick tells Takohanas about a dream he had about one of them getting killed. Takohanas gives him a magical charm in the form of a wooden turtle. It will give you the strength of a turtle shell. Sasquatch can lift a car, sweetheart. I don't think a turtle shell is going to be strong enough. Rick tells Takohanas that fighting Sasquatch is too dangerous and it isn't worth it just for a story. But then Takohanas convinces him it's his destiny to be a storyteller, and the movie tries to have this big character moment. Rick tries to convince Takohanas to stop hunting Sasquatch, but she, sh she says she has to or her tribe will disown her. If I fail, I do not deserve my name. So after a little argument in the woods that we could barely hear because somebody was hammering off in the distance. I did not come here to make a team. I came with my grandpa. Rick grabs his gun and they leave to find Sasquatch. Sasquatch breaks into a house through a CGI door because they couldn't have it break a real door, but the filmmakers also couldn't be bothered to take the real door off the hinges, and we see him about to attack Rick's grandma. As Takohanas and Rick run through the, the same open fields where they shot the scene with Chief Sorvino at the beginning of the movie, Rick recognizes the neighborhood and Takohanas explains she had a vision of an old woman. Rick realizes Sasquatch is going after his grandma, so they run to grandma's house. Takohanas tries to fight Sasquatch, but then she does this half-hearted combat roll and drops her bow. And instead of picking it back up right away, she throws two tomahawks at Sasquatch, which of course doesn't work. So then Sasquatch starts strangling her, so Rick picks up the bow and shoots Sasquatch right in the heart, killing him. <laughs> So Sasquatch is defeated, but Takohanas appears to be dying from her injuries. Grandma tells Rick some nonsensical platitudes about love or something. Don't worry, love is moving on. So Rick bends over to pick up Takohanas, and the movie cuts away to a random shot of Grandma while he's doing that because the actor couldn't lift her. Rick takes Takohanas back to the tent, but it looks like she's dying. A stick tips over like it's supposed to be symbolic or something. But then Rick sprinkles some of the shit from Takohanas' bag on her. The next morning, Takohanas steps out of the tent to thank Rick, but then the Thunderbird screeches again, telling Takohanas she has more Sasquatches to kill. Rick tells her not to go, but she tells him to fuck off, then makes the tent disappear. Rick picks up the wooden turtle from earlier and begs her to stay with him, but she says she can't because of destiny or some shit. So then Rick tells her he's going with her. They kiss, and I guess the actors weren't comfortable doing it for more than a second because the movie keeps cutting back and forth between two shots really quickly to draw it out for dramatic effect. And then they walk off into the sunset. The Thunderbird flies at the camera, and then, just to top off this whole mess, the movie ends with the most insane and indescribable Eldritch theme song I've ever heard. <laughs> So that's Suburban Sasquatch, which is simultaneously the best and worst Sasquatch movie ever made. You should get drunk and watch it with your friends. Uh, now what? Hey man, I, uh, I just wanted to apologize for, uh, breaking down your door and throwing you into a table. It's just that I, uh, I get a little bit frustrated sometimes and, well... Oh, uh, that's okay. It's not like you're the first supernatural creature to ever make my life miserable. Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't need this broom anymore, so I just wanted to give it back. You can keep it. Special shout out to Agent James and Weebstuff64 for the obnoxious dubstep intros they made for me. I didn't give them anything for them, so go subscribe to the channels or something. Links in the description. Oh, and like this video, leave a comment, and subscribe. And support me on Patreon. Follow me on Twitter, and submit your fan art to me on Facebook. Those links in the description, too. Bye.